very, very warm welcome to this event on happiness and success with uh, Sean Aker. And Sean, it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for letting me join. Really uh, lovely to see uh, you again and to see so many thousands of people joining in this, um, this great online opportunity we have to connect and be together despite being at other sides of the world. Really excited to share so much of your fantastic work with this community of amazing change makers and believers in this mission that we share over the next hour or so. Just for the, the benefit of all of you joining, thank you so much. I can already see lovely messages of welcome from all around the world. It's always a delight to connect with a global community. Uh, Sean and I are going to jump into a conversation together um, looking at a range of really interesting topics about Sean's great work and then uh, give you a chance to sort of put your questions to Sean. I see a few have already cropped up already so please do use the Q&A function. We unfortunately won't have time for all of your questions but really looking forward to putting some of those to Sean because there's so much great experience and wisdom and inspiration I think we're going to see uh, this evening. So um, please do join in the chat and looking forward to to having all of us together in this, this session. So Sean, um, all, all kinds of ways we could approach our conversation together. You are, of course, a positive psychology expert. You do amazing work with organizations, with schools, with individuals. Um, you've given amazing talks. I, I'm a, such a big fan of your TED talk. It's been entertaining me for many years. Um, but I wanted to start actually with the current situation we're in because COVID has been crazy for the world. Uh, it's been a source of much unhappiness, of course, and a lot of change and uncertainty. And as you know, with Action for Happiness, we have these monthly themes and campaigns. We're in optimistic October at the moment. And at one level, this idea of being optimistic seems a bit incongruous at the moment because of so much uncertainty and fear and anxiety. How do you see this current situation and how important is optimism at a time like this? Well, first of all, Mark, just thank you so much for letting you, me join you and all the incredible people that are on right now. Um, it's great to be amongst kindred spirits in the midst of this challenge. So um, thank you to you and all the work that you've done and to everyone who's joined here tonight or in the morning or wherever you are in the world right now. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, I had about a quarter of my talks uh, postpone until next year, as soon as the, the crisis began, um, because they felt like it was tone deaf to talk about happiness this year in the midst of all the suffering that people are experiencing. So they thought, let's talk about happiness when it's much easier. <laughs> let's talk about happiness a year from now, once we have a vaccine, once the pandemic's under control, uh, which I think is such a missed opportunity because I feel like this research, as you know, matters most now. Um, and I don't think that it's tone deaf. In fact, I feel like that optimism in, in, in good times is almost a, a luxury item or it can seem that way. But I feel like based upon the research we've been seeing about how the brain works so much better, has this incredible advantage in terms of our business outcomes, our energy, our resilience. If we have big problems facing us, we need the best brain possible to bear upon that situation. So one of the things that I think is crucial as we look at not only the pandemic, but at any challenges that an organization or a family or a patient is experiencing is to really start with, um, with rational optimism. Um, irrational optimists, you know, uh, irrational optimists sugarcoat uh, the world and then they give happiness a bad name um, because people think that they're divorced from reality, right? We stop believing in their leadership and their vice and their parenting. What I really think is crucial and we can see it in the political and the economic landscape too is this need for starting with a realistic assessment of the present, a realistic assessment of the challenges that a pandemic uh, creates within our world. The, a realistic assessment of the social injustices and the structural racism that we see across the globe. We start with realism, but we maintain this belief that our behavior matters if linked to the right people. And when that occurs, I think that you get a completely different shift to the way that we respond to the world. Um, one of the things I, I found fascinating just on this topic is a couple of years ago, I gave a talk to a group of CEOs uh, out in Northern California, all Silicon Valley, top CEOs. And afterwards, one of the CEOs offered to drive me to the airport to talk about this research um, and, and how we could put it into his company. I was so excited. I got into this guy's really nice sports car. I don't know what it was. It was fancy. The doors went up instead of out and it wasn't a Tesla. And I got in and I figured out how to close the door and put on my seatbelt. He immediately started telling me his company had been growing so quickly and uh, his stress levels have been skyrocketing. And as we were speeding towards the airport and weaving all over the road, I was holding on for dear life, wondering why I got in the car with this guy. And uh, uh, that little bell in his car was going off, the seatbelt bell, and eventually it stopped going off. I got tired and I turned to him and I was like, 
you don't wear a seatbelt? She said, no, Sean, I, I listened to your talk. I love your research. I'm an optimist too, and kept driving. <laughs> and I was like, no, you're crazy. <laughs> That's not optimism. That's a divorce from reality. What we really need are people that believe their behavior matters. So they're taking the systematic habit and work routine changes and the safety regards um, precautions so that we can actually create a better world. That's, that's so important, Sean, and I'm really glad you made that distinction because, of course, we are facing uh, lots of challenges and we can't actually change lots of what's going on around us in the world, but we can choose our actions. And I think as we move towards thinking about some of the work you've been doing with organisations of all types around the world, it seems to me that one of the messages that's core that you've already hinted at is that our actions really matter, that what we do has some efficacy. We can't change the world, but we can affect our own mood and our own success in many ways and of course have this ripple effect on others around us would, would you like to sort of refresh for us some of those core messages that come out of the positive psychology research that are relevant whether you're in a you know a company a hospital a school or a family what would you how would you summarize them well um for those of you i don't know i, I got into this research um when i was initially researching um at harvard i was at harvard divinity school studying christian and buddhist ethics looking at how your beliefs about the world change the way that you decide to act in it and intervene in it and try to change it. Um, and some people in the psychology department told me about positive psychology, uh, the great Dr. Tal Ben Shahar, uh, Ellen Langer, and they, they said, we'd like to ask them the questions you're asking at the Divinity School, but put a scientific language around it. Um, what they didn't know is when that was occurring, when they were inviting me over to kind of explore that world, I was going through two years of depression myself. So feeling like my behavior didn't matter, feeling disconnected, uh, uh, and separate from happiness. And one of the things that hooked me into positive psychology was that when I applied the habits, um, I was able to change. So um, I think that the core message I think is not that happiness is an incredible advantage um, or that you know, positive psychology is fantastic. To me, the, the core message is that change is possible. Um, I think we're taught in high school, you're your genes and your environment. So you're born with whatever, whatever genes predispose you to intelligence and creativity and athleticism and obesity and depression. And then you're whatever happens to you in an environment, whatever happens to you in a pandemic, whatever happens to you at a hospital, whatever happens to you in a school. Um, the problem is we're victims of both. You and I didn't get to pick our parents um, and the world has become so big, we don't necessarily can control what's going on in the macro environment. But when we look back into the data, and this is why I loved positive psychology, is that you found these weirdos in the data, these outliers that weren't going with what we expected based upon their genes and their environment, that they were making these small habit changes or they changed the way that they interacted with people or they changed their work routines and they were breaking the tyranny of genes and environment over their trajectory of optimism. Um, and when that occurred, then we saw all these cascading benefits, like every single business and educational outcome we knew how to test for would then rise. So what I loved about it was that the greatest advantage you could give to a brain in the modern economy wasn't something that the lucky inherited from having good genes or a good environment, but it was something we could cultivate, craft, and train that would then allow us to make a better world for other people. Mm. So, so that sort of ties in nicely to the theme we chose for tonight about happiness and success. How do you see that relationship? Um, well, I, I think at, at, at root, I believe, and I see it in my own life all the time, uh, that I follow the wrong formula for happiness and success. I keep thinking, if I work hard and achieve these goals, think how happy I'll be. I, I don't know how many, I mean, I've said that over and over again, despite knowing all this research in the middle of the pandemic. Once the pandemic is over, think how happy I'll be. Once I can go to a restaurant, think how happy I'll be. You know, Once my kids can go back to school, think how happy I'll be. In each of those moments, I keep thinking that happiness will come after some point. And there are definitely ways in which my life might improve if the pa pandemic ends. But what's fascinating about it is I hear that refrain over and over again, once the pandemic's over, then we'll all feel happy, which is definitely not the case because as you know, you've been working on this for more than a decade, trying to raise levels of happiness in the world. What we're finding is everyone wasn't, everyone wasn't happy before the pandemic and then the pandemic just screwed things up, right? We have been dealing with tons of issues and we, the problems are omnipresent. Um, what, what I think is fascinating is 
how happiness then impacts those. So, you know, if we keep thinking, if I get good grades, then I'll feel happier. You know, if I get into the right school, I'll feel happier. If I get married, think how happy I'll be. <laughs> Remember that one, right? Or like, as soon as I have kids, think how happy I'll be. I'll be happy forever. And then, then they have to be healthy and they have to be right school. The problem is at root, every time the brain has a success, your brain changes the goalpost of what success looks like, which is highly adaptive. Otherwise we would have stopped trying to be successful the first time we put Legos together, right? We want our concept of success to keep ramping up to see what our potential is. The problem would be is if we assume happiness will exist on the opposite side of success because our brain actually never quite gets there. We push it over the cognitive horizon, which is why we initially assumed in positive psychology that there might not be a correlation or causation between happiness and success because you see these incredibly successful people, these professional athletes and these celebrities who are the wealthy who have everything and still don't have happiness. But then if you flipped it around, if we were with a person who's homeless or a celebrity or someone who's running a hospital or teaching a kindergarten class, if we were able to raise their levels of happiness, optimism, social connection, or gratitude, then every single success rate we, were know, we knew how to test for from productivity to profitability, to energy levels, to resilience, to symptoms, uh, the acuteness of symptoms, to the impact of stress upon, all of those improved. So there was a correlation causation. It was just flowing the opposite direction of what we were expecting. So what I really work on um, with the organizations that I work with and the school systems and the hospitals is, is how do we, in the midst of this challenge right now, whatever challenge that is from a pandemic, to you know, being home with our kids, to um, uh, challenges we feel uh, with social injustice, that how do we create optimism, gratitude, and social connection that becomes the fuel for creating greater level of change? That happiness is the joy we feel moving towards our potential, not just the result of it. So it's not so much the destination as the journey and the, the process in some ways, yeah. Um, so you already hinted there at some of the, I think the building blocks of what comes out of the research and what you might then do as an organization or as a hospital or family and so on. You, you hint, I think, at gratitude, connection and other things. Maybe you could remind us on what some of the, you know, I think you painted a brilliant picture of why this matters and the fact that it really is a, uh, you know, happiness is a building block for the, the things we value in society. But, but what are some of the skills, what are some of the practices that really drive that most that you've seen and practiced personally and also you've seen working in different types of organizations? So I, I really wanted there to be something really sexy and high tech and really very complex that could create greater levels of happiness in people's lives. Um, and it's uh, disappointingly um, uh, mundane, but extraordinarily powerful when we research it. So I got the opportunity to work uh, briefly with the former US Surgeon General in the United States, um, Vivek Murthy. And we were talking about how, you know, people think that they can't change in terms of their happiness because they think that they're, it's their genes, their environment. You ask them why they're not happy, they'll tell you something external um, or about a, a genetic code. Um, and he said, it's you know, so fascinating because if you, you know, if you look around this room, everyone in this room has genes for teeth that should rot out by age 15 in, in a high sugar society. Um, that's what it is to be human unless you get people to create a daily habit of brushing their teeth every day of their life. <laughs> And then what it is to be human transforms dramatically. I believe the same thing is true for happiness. I believe that these small, simple habits, as mundane as brushing your teeth, have huge implications for the long-term um, uh, outcome, not only of our lives, but um, of our success rates as well, and our ability to ripple that out to other people. Earlier this summer, I got the opportunity to work um, uh, with NASA. Um, and one of the questions I had for them was, uh, you know, we're dealing with social distancing and we know you know how important social connection is to happiness. Um, how do you create happiness when you're socially distanced by several miles from the earth? Mm -hmm. um, and what they said was, uh, one of the very first things that they learned is if you wanna keep up the morale and the happiness of an astronaut, you keep a schedule that includes positive habits in it. So while you're brushing your teeth, you're thinking of things you're grateful for. So that's what we've been looking for. What are those very simple habits, maybe to let, take less than two minutes a day that can, we can routinize that causes positive changes. Um, if you believe any of the work that you know, I've done and that so many much more brilliant uh, positive psychologists have done about how happiness leads to greater levels of success, the very next question we should be asking is, okay, then what am I doing before I try to create success to raise my levels of happiness? What am I doing 
before my kids go off to school to raise their levels of happiness, right? Um, so we've been looking at very simple things, gratitude exercises, um, uh, as everyone on this call already knows and maybe does, uh, but uh, uh, I went into American Express and had them think of three things that they're grateful for for 21 days in a row during the banking crisis. And 21 days later, it had no impact upon them. And what I learned from that is the importance of research, but also um, I misunderstood what gratitude actually was. Um, Emmons and McCullough argued that, uh, you know, it's not just what you're grateful for that matters, it's, uh, it's the scanning. So we had people, and this is something I do within my life, this is how uh, um, we start our virtual school with my son, uh, it's what pulled me through some challenges this year, is I think of three new things that are, I'm grateful for that have occurred over the past 24 hours. We know from previous research that that can take people that were continually testing as pessimists, low level pessimists, and move them up to a low level of optimism simply by a 45 second disruptor similar to brushing your teeth. We know that two minutes of writing down every detail you can remember about a single positive experience um, each day for a period of 21 days in a row, not only dramatically improves the amount of meaning that you perceive in your day, um, because it literally only takes a single mo node of meaning in a day for your brain to judge it as positive, but we've seen people with neuromuscular disease, their pain medication and doctor visits drop by 50%. Uh, meditation, exercise, uh, writing a two minute positive email, praising or thanking someone in your life. This is one of the ones that I study the most is looking at getting people to create a pattern when they first come into work. We did this initially at Facebook, writing a two minute positive email, praising or thanking someone in your life and do that for a period of 21 days in a row. Down, around day eight, you run out of people. You're like, well, that's everyone. <laughs> that's all my, I wrote <laughs> to my mom twice. But then you have to scan just like with gratitudes and you're scanning for that mentor who got you your job or that high school English teacher that impacted you or uh, that friend you haven't talked to since high school that just had a baby on Facebook. And what, what you see very quickly is that even when we feel socially distanced and socially isolated, we actually have a robust ecosystem of social connections that our brain is usually not aware of. And when you heighten that awareness, that two minute positive email ramps up social connection, which is one of the greatest predictors of resilience long-term levels of happiness, social connection is as predictive of how long we end up living as obesity, high blood pressure, or smoking. So we fight so hard against the negative and the symptoms in our world, and we forget to tell people how simple, positive, two-minute interventions might have dramatic impacts upon people's lives. Mm. Wow, Sean, thank you. There's so much within what you've just said there. <clears throat> and I'm grateful because you've helped me realize why some of what I've built into my own life is both connected to the research, but also why why it's so helpful so i was skeptical about the kind of writing down good things the gratitude until i put it into practice in a way that lasted in the way that i realized i'm a sort of to-do list person and i started thinking well why don't i put things on my to-do list that i actually want to be like make it more like a to-be list so it, you know i can't get through my list of tasks for the day until i start the day with a bit of mindfulness i've ended the day with a kind of bit of gratitude so that sort of daily habit for me a bit like cleaning his teeth as you say has helped me turn something that's sort of vaguely interesting into a, like a, a, a lifelong habit, I hope. And I've also found myself doing that scanning you mentioned. So, you know, I find that during the day, even a difficult day, I'll be on the lookout for like, oh, that's something to write down in my list of good things. It's almost like it tunes my mind to look out for things that I would otherwise overlook. So I'm grateful for that. But I also had a little nudge. I've started putting in my uh, at a regular reminder to, to reach out to, to friends and loved ones just to reconnect. It's been so important during the pandemic to keep that connection. So I'm really grateful for your reminder of that idea of a just a short friendly email or some way of reaching out to people um in a moment i'd love to ask you about your own personal habits because people are all, all, always love to hear about things and i know that you know you although you're an expert in happiness just like uh, all of us working in this area we all have difficult times and face personal trauma and adversity but before i ask you about that i'm just intrigued you mentioned nasa you're working with nasa is that why you have the um the nasa rocket behind you there <laughs> What's the, yeah. is that my, uh, so actually, my son, mo mostly my six-year-old son, Leo, put it together. Um, it's a Saturn V Lego rocket um, with 1,969 pieces, so 1969 wow. when it got so very clever. Um, but I, we built it for that, and then I've just kept it up because it made me so happy. But um, it's, it, I love, too, that you know these are extraordinarily brilliant people at the cutting edge of science that are struggling looking for how do I incorporate happiness into my day to make this you know, work go better, right? So I, I, I think uh, it, it's just a constant reminder that like we all need this. And so what do you find, you know, especially in some of the more difficult times in your own life, what, what's really helped you in terms of the research? Um, so I've, 
I have to do these habits. I think I have genes that predispose me towards pessimism. We have, or depression. Um, we have it in my family. I think that's part of the reason I went through um, uh, depression. Also this year, the reason I'm standing up for this is I just went through back surgery. Um, the past two months up until about a week ago were some of the most challenging in my entire life. Um, I'd studied chronic pain. I'd worked with the National uh, MS Society working around positive psychology and, and managing chronic pain. But those were words to me uh, until I experienced it. And now not only do I have sympathy, but so much empathy because my back was in so much pain and uh, I couldn't do all the things. I can't pick up my two-year-old daughter. I had to go through surgery and all that. And I had to lean hard on these habits to get me through uh, the time because I'd wake up each day and want the day to be over. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing that pulled me through it most was actually the, the, the two minute positive text message. Uh, so I'd find somebody that I needed to reach out to um, and I'd let them in. So we, we study, we work in fields of happiness. Um, going through periods of unhappiness doesn't mean we're failing. Not putting into practice what we preach means we're failing at this, right? And so I was going through unhappiness, but almost don't want to tell people that, right? Like I, I don't want to burn, I want to be there for other people. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be going through pain. I want to be an athlete. I want to be, you know, able to do things with my body. So, but I let people in. I told them that I was struggling um, uh, uh, over the course of the day. And then I was going through pain. And because of that, um, not only was I able to reach out to people. So it reminded me that there are people in my life, life even though we're quarantining, um, but then they would open up about things they were dealing with. They would open up about back pain or the challenges they went through when they had a very difficult pregnancy. Or one of my friends just told me that he has prostate cancer and he hadn't told anyone. And because I had opened up that channel, it created this uh, 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 a two-way street. So no, instead of you know, being a one-way friend, you know, just being there for other people, it created so much more of this reciprocation um, that was what pulled me through the day. Like, what I was most grateful for was usually something around uh, that, that meaningful relationship with them. So I, I do the gratitude exercises. Um, it's how we've actually done um, virtual school with my son. So he's been home since March. Um, and so at the beginning, I'm doing a lot of work with schools, as you know, um, working with trying to bring this into to low income areas. And I went into one of the hardest hit areas in the United States, in Flint, Michigan. And one of the grandmothers there in the midst of poverty, in the midst of a water crisis they've had and all the jobs going away and the massive amounts of crime. In the midst of it, she keeps a glass jar in her kitchen. And when her grandkids would come over to visit her, um, she'd listen for anything that was good going on in their lives. At school, something going on with a friend. And she'd write it down on a scrap sheet of paper, crumple it up and put it into this glass jar. And then when her grandkids would come back over, she'd force them to sit down. She's one of these grandmothers, force them to sit down and she'd read out everything in the jar to them to remind them of all the blessings going on in their life. In the midst of, you know, sometimes what seems like a hopeless situation, I heard that and I was like, we have so much to be grateful for with our family. We have to be doing this as well. So that's how we start our virtual school each day. We have a glass jar that I got on Amazon. Um, that was like $7 that simulating what this woman was doing. We filled it up twice now. And both times we filled it up um, with all these things that my son's been grateful for and that I've been grateful for. When we read back through it, 80% of the things I had forgotten about. I was like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, that was amazing. Um, but 80% of the blessings in my life I lost access to but I could tell you then and now every fire I need to put out in my inbox, my brain, our brains will naturally scan for threats within this world unless we consciously craft habits to change the way our brains are, are devoting those mental resources. And so now we keep our favorite um, gratitudes in that, uh, in that little glass jar. We almost made it like a competition, but my son always wins. Um, but basically <laughs> it's, uh, we, you know, we write down our favorite ones and keep it in there. So we're gonna keep reading it over and over again and printing those messages. So if you look around that. at our house, oh, good. So I think that's so good. And it's, it's in line with what I think I'm seeing on the chat as well. Libby, for example, says we start our family dinner time with what went well and three good things. And so, I, you know, there was lots of ways to bring this to life. I'm actually really grateful you shared that personal story as well, because I think it's so powerful, as you said, to express that vulnerability and to, to realize that when you do that, you're also giving others a chance to help you and to open up themselves. I think that's so powerful. But I wondered maybe, because we've been talking about gratitude so much, I wondered maybe could we do a little interactive activity with the community here? We've got such a lovely group on the chat here. Maybe we could get people to sort of share something they're grateful for right now. How would you suggest we do that? How could we frame that right now in the current situation? Um, 
You know what I keep hearing in the midst of especially the pandemic is deficit mindset. People scanning for all the things we can't do. And there's mm -hmm. a ton, right? But maybe it'd be really cool and encouraging to hear people um, maybe write down something that they're grateful for that occurred because of the pandemic, right? A post-traumatic growth type of uh, moment. So if there's anything you've been grateful for because of the challenges we've been going through, um, that'd be really cool to hear, especially since we have people from all over the globe right now. Yeah, so please folks get on the chat, just share just a little thing um, that, that you're feeling grateful for. So we've seen Catherine saying, I've got a stable job. Uh, Andrew there spending more time walking the dog and time with family, joining the Action for Happiness webinars. Thank you for that. Um, creating new series of videos, grateful for health, um, riding bike on the trails, family's got more close, keeping in touch with people, more time with children, I can't really read these, they're going fast, so, so fast, fast, but um, oh, someone has kindly said the Action for Happiness app, thank you for that, getting to know neighbours better, uh, more focus on, on uh, childcare and health, uh, warm home and a garden, more time with my son, um, taking an art course because I couldn't go camping, and so the list goes on, so that's really lovely, Sean, because I think what we're seeing here, and there's, there's hundreds more, is just lots of little things that people might otherwise take for granted I think I mean I love what you said there about the fact that when we look back on these we suddenly sort of think oh I'd, I'd forgotten about that and I and I find that when I do this at night it helps me settle down to sleep more with a framing around like actually even though today felt quite stressful there's so much I I can be grateful for yeah I think you're absolutely right and I think that those small things what gets me excited about them is that then people create org organic changes off of them right like I went in when I was in Flint, Michigan, we were talking about doing gratitude, gratitude exercises by yourself, thinking of three things you're grateful for. And they were turning it into creating these gratitude boards and going into the community and creating these positive change. So I just talked uh, earlier this year before um, COVID uh, and the pandemic hit, I got the opportunity to work with six battalions of Marines out at Camp Pendleton in, in California um, for this guy named Colonel Rideout, which is cool military name. Um, and he, uh, he just texted me last week and said that one of the things that they've done, I didn't talk to him about this. I talked to him about gratitude and writing two minute positive emails and meditation. And, um, and I was super nervous <laughs> with all Marines uh, sitting there in this room of just complete the green and uh, fatigues everywhere. Um, uh, he said that one of the things they've done is that normally when they get together, what they do is they talk about their the worst cases and how to deal with them. Like who's on their on their team that's not doing what they're supposed to. And he's like, that's usually less than 1% of our Marines. So he tasked each of them to go and each one of the meetings to seek out and then bring back who's done something incredible on the team that you'd wanna mention. So they keep hearing these stories, not of people they're screwing up. They keep scanning and then reporting and creating this narrative about all these things that are working. And it's such an antidote to what we feel right now where we look at the news and it's all negative information. My wife, Michelle Gielen, you know, looks, and studied so much about how, you know, three minutes, she did this with Ariana Huffington several years ago, that three minutes of negative news exposure in the morning compared to neutral news, three minutes of negative news uh, impacted your mood. But six to eight hours later, while you're picking your kids up from school or making dinner, uh, you had a 27% higher likelihood of reporting a negative day. Um, so we're literally taking these poison pills, right? Where our brain is constantly scanning for the negative and missing out on the positive. But what she found in subsequent research is that if you just append a solution to the problem, even if people don't take that solution, like if you talk about uh, food shortages and how you could donate to a food bank, um, it turns out on the very next task, your creativity and problem solving nearly triples. So I feel like we've got all these broken bridges in our brain and we need to spend time retraining our brain to think about the things we're grateful for, finding the meaning, finding the ecosystem around us. Mm, and I, I'm, I'm being blown away here by just the examples that are still coming on the chat here. I think certainly the opportunity for each of us to share things we're grateful for, but also just to see other people's gratitude, I find incredibly inspiring and I think is almost the antidote to the negative news that you refer to. So what we'll do folks is, as always, we'll capture the chat from this and we'll circulate it to you with all the other links and resources and video tomorrow so you can have a chance to check in on just all these amazing things in the community that people are sharing despite the really severe challenges many people are facing. Um, in a moment I'd love to come on to some of your more recent work on big potential Sean but before we do that you mentioned briefly about the the school system I know you've been doing some amazing work in schools 
And so many of us who care about creating a happier, fairer world, you know, think that the next generation is so important. You know, teaching these positive psychology and resilience skills, teaching mindfulness, teaching gratitude as part of a, co a core part of what it means to grow up and be a good human being. Tell us a bit about what, what you think needs to happen in schools and what some of what you've been trying to do in the education system. Well, I fell backwards into it. I was doing some research at Nationwide Insurance, and we found that if we could raise the levels of happiness of their sales team, um, the, uh, we were able to raise their revenues by 50% over an 18 month period of time. They were so blown away that small little things could impact their outcomes. One of the guys there says, said, we need to get this into our schools. So he paid to get the research that Nationwide Insurance was having and brought the same corporate information into the poorest school district in Iowa in the United States. Um, it was a bottom 10% school as judged by President Obama's administration. And we only had resources to just work with the superintendent, the uh, administrators and the teachers. So we didn't even get to the, the students. And what we worked on with them on were very simple things, gratitude exercises, creating positive work routines and deepening social connection. Um, literally it was a two day intervention with a couple boosters over the course of the next two years. Turns out over the next three years, their standardized test scores rose by 20%. It's open enrollment in Iowa. So kids from the richer counties started coming to the poorest county in Iowa to get a better education. They had the highest literacy score change that they had in the entire state. And it started to spread out from there. So then we went up to Chicago to a school district that had uh, elevated rates of, of, of their, their poverty rate went from almost nothing to 35% in one year. So we assumed their academics would drop but we came in and we worked with the students and got them to create these positive habits. And then we created these parent universities where the students had their parents come up to the school and their guardians and their grandparents, and they taught them the positive habits. So the parents were learning from the kids how to do these simple positive psychology habits. Turns out their academics didn't go down. They went from the 83rd percentile to the 95th in, in Illinois, and now the top 2% in the United States. And um, not only, and, and now, uh, uh, not only did the test scores improve, but we've been tracking the disciplinary actions, which dropped nearly in half. Uh, depression rates dropped by 30%. Uh, calls to the 911 center dropped by 40%. So what we were seeing was that these intractable problems that we see within our world because of inequality and poverty and the challenges in education. My mom was a high school English teacher, so this is why I'm passionate about this. We were finding that if you wanted to really create social emotional learning, you actually had to provide it to the, to the providers. You had to create social emotional learning and positive connection with the teachers and the, and the superintendents that then flowed into the schools that flowed out into the community. So now what we're interested in is what happens when, not, not, not only can we make a teacher happier, we know that, but what happens when you make that teacher happier? What happens to that teacher, students, parents' outcomes on the backside? Mm, I think we often forget the, the whole culture within a school or a learning environment is created by sort of atmosphere. And, you know, so many teachers feel under massive pressure, there's a stress environment there, so much is expected of them and they do wonderful work, but actually there's no way they can create a culture of positive habits if they're feeling in a really dark and difficult place themselves. So I think that's, it's so inspiring to hear that you're having success with that affecting children's lives, but also that this works in those disadvantaged backgrounds. Because often I think there's an accusation of the positive psychology movement that it's about making already fairly happy people happier. But actually, I think you're showing that it's it's most powerful, actually, in helping people that, that sort of had the greatest need. And I think that's so inspiring to hear that you found that. Um, on that topic, really, I guess, you know, your your original fabulous book, The Happiness Advantage, uh, to paraphrase it, was sort of how can we as individuals develop our happiness in order to thrive and succeed in whatever we, we turn ourselves to in our lives? But of course, as you know, with our great passion with Action for Happiness, it's about a collective improvement of, you know, community, national and indeed global well-being. And I, so I love the sort of direction that your big potential work has gone in around sort of the fact that we're all interconnected. Could you say a bit more about what, what you discovered in that work and what the key message is there? Yeah, I'd love, so I'd love to tell you two studies from it. Um, but let me tell you just briefly about the background of it, because I think yeah. this feeds into why, you know, I, I think we see happiness researchers um, and the wrong, well, we, we assume that everything's going right in their life, right? So um, I work for, uh, forever on this book, Big Potential, because I was fascinated at what happens at the end, 
how we pursue happiness and success in an interconnected way. So I wrote this book called Big Potential that almost no one knows about, right? Like, um, and the reason for that is because it came out two years ago in February, um, because my wife was pregnant at the time. We were going to have a child in April. So we said, let's have it at the beginning of February. You go on your two or three look long, week long book tour and I get off the road and be there with my wife. Um, during the first week of February, the book came out. And during that same week, uh, during the Super Bowl in the United States for football, during when, while my team was playing in the first quarter, my wife's water broke. Um, we didn't know that was what was going on at the time. Um, and it was during the Super Bowl. So she Ubered to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> husband of the year. Um, I got her an XL, a larger one, so it's okay. But <laughs> she, she got there and they said, ma'am, your water broke. You need to stay here for six weeks trying to hold this baby in. Um, and uh, three days later, our, our daughter was born. Um, we didn't have a name for her. We almost lost her three times over the next two days. Her name is Zoe uh -huh. Sparks Acor. And my wife, Michelle, just put her down for a nap. She's doing wonderfully. But instead Good. of going on this uh, the reason I want to tell you that instead of going on this book tour, talking about this research on the interconnection of happiness and success, instead in my life for the next 50 days, my happiness sat in an incubator in NICU being cared for by these angels that were keeping her alive when my success rate would have been zero. I wasn't even allowed to touch her for the first several weeks because my son was sick. And what we got to do is to battle test the, the research I wanted to share with you. Um, and, and I know you, you already know some of this, but for those of you who don't know these studies, I think these are amazing. Um, the first one is very simple and I always get blank looks when I say it in a talk, but I think it's life-changing. Uh, these two researchers, um, perception researchers, which is usually not that exciting a field, uh, found that if you look at a hill, you need to climb in front of you. If you look at that hill by yourself, your brain architects a picture of that hill in your visual cortex when, when you're alone that's 20% steeper. The mountain looks 20% steeper when you're alone compared to when you view that hill standing next to someone who's gonna climb it with you, which shouldn't be happening. The hill's not changing. I always thought if I saw a hill, I know how tall it is and I can decide whether or not to climb it. That's not how human perception actually works. There's things that impact perception, including chronic pain, but one of them is whether or not you feel alone or with others overcoming a challenge. It literally transforms the geometry of the challenges in our life. So much so that I believe that means that when we put happiness books in the self-help section of a bookstore, we're making it 20 to 30% steeper for people to achieve because they think it's something we have to do on their own. When in truth, what we're finding is the height of your potential is predicted by the people around you. Um, the other study that's become a metaphor for all the work we've been doing out at hospitals and schools in the midst of this is these, this researcher in 1935 discovered the species of fireflies that instead of lighting up individually and randomly like they do across the globe to attract a mate, the entire community lights up and goes dark simultaneously, simulating a lightning strike using these neurotransmitters. Um, when you reported it, no one believed him. He lost his job when he wrote a scientific paper about it because we know how the world works. It's supposed to be survival of the fittest. You have to be the fastest, brightest light shining. So why would you light up when your competition's lit up? It doesn't make any evolutionary sense. And then eight decades later, a few years ago, two researchers at MIT found in only two places in the globe, fireflies have evolved to do something different. Instead of lighting up individually and randomly, they light up as an interconnected community. And when they light up individually, their success rate of reproduction uh, per night is 3%, which is still really good. But it turns out when they light up as an interconnected community, their success rate goes from 3% to 82% per bug. It's not like one bug's doing amazing with the new system. Like keep going guys, best night of my life. It's the entire system was doing orders of magnitude better than we thought was possible. That's what we saw with Project Aristotle at Google where they found that if I know individual traits of the members of a team, we can't predict the success rate of the team. Only when you look at the only thing that was predictive of the success rate of the team was the social cohesion. Do you like the people that you work with and feel connected to them? Do you have the psychological safety to voice your opinion? And can you express your individual uh, trait in connection with others? When that happened, people were vastly outperforming their individual traits. It's what I found at Harvard. The greatest predictor of happiness and success at Harvard was your social connection score. So to me, the importance of this began, uh, I think that there's uh, uh, a glass ceiling, an invisible ceiling on our happiness if it's only about us. But if we're able to break through that and maybe move those gratitudes external, we find that at LinkedIn, when we got people to write that two minute positive email, thanking somebody else, 
that that leader triples the amount of praise that they give over the course of the day. They transform how they think of themselves. But when people receive three plus touch points of praise, they double the amount of praise they get back in. So you create this virtuous cycle where like the light from those fireflies, it keeps getting bigger as they become successful. You create a, a bigger and bigger response. So I, this I think is that's what we, where, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, this is exactly what we're saying with the action happiness community that when you're kind of there to sort of work out ways to live happier through helping each other, through connecting, through being part of something bigger than yourself, it becomes really, really life-changing. Um, just wanted to say, there's a lot of people on the chat just saying how glad they are that your daughter is okay. And thank you for sharing that story. That must've been a, a difficult time. And on this theme of, um, of you know, the, the togetherness, the being with others and so on, Nikki had a lovely thing. She said, I like the quote, it's not the journey or the destination, but the company that matters. You know, it's kind of like who we're taking the journey with. Uh, I think that's very powerful. Um, but, but, it, but it reminds me that there's a challenge in this, Sean. So I, I sometimes think when I see sleep researchers talking about how important sleep is and how terrible it is for our well-being if we don't get enough sleep, that like if you're an insomniac, that's quite a, a, a sort of distressing thing to hear. Similarly, there are lots of people who don't feel very socially connected. Loneliness is on the rise. I mean, COVID is accelerating this problem. But, you know, if you're somebody who doesn't feel that you've got a lot of close relationships around you, knowing that, that social connection is so important is sort of slightly disheartening is also, what, what can we do in that situation to try and even just slightly become a bit more socially connected so i love i think that what you're saying is so important to recognize i, I saw an article recently that said it's okay to not be okay it was an editorial mm. in the new york times and I, it is okay to not be okay we also don't want to stay that way if we don't have to right um i think social isolation so with happiness uh, if you say, you know, that people can create habits to raise their levels of happiness, that sounds common sense to many of the people watching this, but it's also a burden, right? Because it's saying you don't get to just rely on your genes environment to create happiness. It's actually a radical and challenging comment to say that we could actually co-create greater levels of happiness within our life. I think the same thing's true with social connection. What's encouraging to me is that happiness isn't just something that's static, it's something we could actually grow, that we could do it with uh, these habits and we could do it with one another. Same thing with social connection. So when I was going through two years of depression at Harvard, I had people around me, um, but I didn't feel them. Um, some of the loneliness studies says, it's not about the number of people that you have around you, it's the lack of feeling like you have a meaningful impact on anyone around you. So what we try to do is we break that cycle. So um, at the depth of my depression, I had reached out to my eight closest friends and family and tell them I was going through depression, um, that I needed them. They rallied behind me. But as soon as I did that, that hill of overcoming depression dropped by 10, 20, 30% because I'm not overcoming that hill alone. And they were opening up about things they were dealing with. So to make it tactical and practical, what I found is that that exercise where I have people write for two minutes a day, praising or thanking someone in their life, when somebody's feeling socially isolated, they get to around day, mo most people get to around day eight before they have to really start scanning, right? Uh, socially isolated, we feel like there's one to three people, if that, right? So what is important about that exercise is the scanning again, just like with the gratitude. Um, when you scan for the gratitudes within your life, your brain basically builds a background app passively using resources to scan for the positive you will use next day. That's why we see an impact upon optimism. Same thing with the social connection. I think that there are nodes of connection in our life that we ignore or are not aware of. So what we're trying to do is highlight it. So when they scan, they start to realize that they have a neighbor who, you know, uh, you know, uh, commented them uh, about their dog or that, you know, somebody brought in donuts today at work or a mentor that got them a job that they haven't talked to in three years or a camp counselor that kind of changed the directory of their life or high school English teacher. Uh, that was one of the things I did in depression. I wrote to a high school English teacher and said, you're the reason I fell in love with reading. You're the reason I wrote a book. Thank you for changing my life. It took me 45 seconds to type. It took me longer to find that woman's email address online. I hadn't thought of her in more than a decade. So when I thought about my people, she wasn't on it. But as soon as I scan for her and remembered, oh yeah, she was important. And then wrote to her, I felt like I had a meaningful impact upon her before I even got a response from her, right? So I literally spent all day long thinking about how amazing I was for writing that email in the morning, right? This is one of the benefits of doing this. But what happens is that occasionally they'll write back and she read the note to her class and it created this bond where she now lights up now on my mental map of social connection. So that's what I think is important. We have a social map but what happens when we feel socially isolated is we feel disconnected or feel like we're not having a meaningful impact. Um, my grandmother used to say, if you wanna be a friend, you have to be a friend. I think from the scientific perspective, what we found is that when people 
create that, when they provide social support instead of just waiting to receive it, that's what breaks the cycle of social isolation. And that's what allows people to actually move out of that sense of depression to realize that they have a meaningful impact. By the end of the 21 days, you've meaningfully impacted 21 nodes within your life um, and sometimes gotten feedback back. So what you're seeing is your, your life and your connections really matter. Yeah, well said, thank you. It's a lovely example. Uh, let's come to some of these great questions we're getting on the Q&A. Uh, Jay has said, hi, Sean, I'm in a new job and feeling totally overwhelmed. I'm trying to approach the challenge positively, but the panic keeps winning. Any tips to keep me resilient? So that's um, you know, one example, but I guess there's lots of people dealing with panic right now and, and looking for resilience ideas. What would you suggest? Um, first of all, I'm sorry you're dealing with that. It's uh, a challenge that I think a lot of us are dealing with. Um, I think that each person is different, but I'll give you two um, um, studies that I think are helpful. One of them was um, we went into UBS in the middle of the banking crisis and looked to see how they were dealing with stress when they were just panicked. They didn't even know if the markets were ever going to recover, right? They, half the people lost their job. They weren't getting paid their bonuses. They weren't getting paid. And in the midst of that, we came in and tried to get them to, to, to study how they were dealing with the stress. And some people were trying to fight the stress. They're like, I feel all the stress in my life. I want to decrease it as much as possible, right? So what they were doing was creating a fight or flight response to their fight or flight response. I got to work with Peter Salovey, who's a brilliant um, scientist who came up with emotional intelligence and was the president of Yale and Alia Crum, who's now at a mindfulness lab out in Stanford. And um, we went into UBS and what they taught me was that embedded within every stress is meaning. So if I tell you someone's failing English right now, you don't feel stressed. If I tell you your kid is failing English right now, you feel stressed because there's meaning involved with the relationship. Take out the meaning, then you actually don't feel the stress response. So simply what we got people to do is to acknowledge the stress of their feeling, which uh, we heard in, within that question, acknowledge the stress, then identify why this matters, what the meaning is, and then try to re-channel the emotional response towards that meaning. So if I'm feeling overwhelmed, if my, my inbox is overflowing with spam, I don't feel stressed. If I feel like it's over, uh, with, uh, overflowing with people that need me to get back to them that I care about or that might impact my job or I could raise levels of happiness, there's meaning there, but I was uh, separated from it. Um, so you identify the meaning. And then as I'm sitting in my inbox, I'm can't, constantly trying to tell myself, this is meaningful because I really want to touch people's lives. This is meaningful because I love my child so much and I want them to do well in their life in school. Whatever it is, um, I, I thought that might decrease people's stress. And what we found is it doesn't decrease people's stress at all. Stress levels were the same six weeks later, but the negative impacts of stress, when people perceive meaning involved with the stress, drop by 23%. Headaches, backache, job effectiveness, uh, um, uh, burnout, drop by 23% for the group that saw meaning. So what that means is stress is inevitable, especially in our life, especially in a new job. but uh, the effects of stress are not inevitable. And what it means is that if we identify the meaning, we might be able to transform how stress impacts our lives. So look to see why this is meaningful to you. What is at stake here? And try to keep that top of mind instead of just uh, the uh, emotional response to it. That's really the other helps. thing is, I, I think it's all about momentum. I feel like when things are not going well in my life, I feel like sometimes I'll get negative emails and then I'll suddenly find a flurry of negative emails all at once. I think it's probably the same percentage of negative emails that are occurring, but it gets too much to a point. So then my brain starts deficit a mindset. So I'm constantly scanning for all of those negatives. And what I really have to do is string together one or two successes in order to feel like I'm having any sort of momentum. So if I'm not able to string those together within the work domain, I try to do something else. I'll go do my gratitude exercises. I'll go for a walk. I'll listen to Audible and listen to something I enjoy. I'll call a friend and try and string two of them together. And suddenly I feel like my when my mood improves, my, suddenly it feels like my behavior matters again. And I'm able to start to address those places where I felt out of control. So maybe if within the workspace, it doesn't feel like our behavior matters, try and find um, outside work, uh, work out and things outside of your work life that allow you to string together those to then import that momentum back into the work. That's so helpful, Sean, thank you. Um, but it, it links interestingly to another question I wanted to share, which is a lot of what you've um, talk to Sue this evening and, and actually a lot of what we promote with Action for Happiness is about sort of taking action, building these habits and, and sometimes that can feel a bit exhausting. It's like we're striving, we're really pushing, we're, you know, we're, we're forcing ourselves into these actions and creating pressure on ourselves as a result. And so Keeley's asked, 
how do you know when to stop with the sort of grit and keeping going to cultivate happiness with habits? And when should you just sort of stop, press pause and just rest? And we know that sort of sleep and calm periods are vital for our well-being. So how do you balance that sort of taking action, having efficacy versus just being a little bit at peace with the world? Um, I, so I, first of all, I think we have to start with grace for ourselves, uh, especially for all the optimists that are joining us, for people that study happiness, that create action for happiness, right? That uh, it's okay to not have a good day, right? It's okay to sometimes not be happy. You know, I think the opposite of happiness to me isn't unhappiness. Unhappiness fuels great change, right? Uh, when we're unhappy, it shows us when we feel alone or unhappiness shows us when the world is unjust or racist. Uh, un unhappiness can fuel positive change. I think the opposite, what we're fighting against is apathy. Apathy is the belief that my behavior doesn't matter coupled with feeling no joy moving towards our potential. So if as we're doing those habits, we lose that sense of joy moving forward, we're not gonna benefit as much from those individual habits as, as well. So what I would say is two, twofold. One is, we never get tired of brushing our teeth. No one wakes up and is like, well, I brushed my teeth for a decade. I'm out, <laughs> right? That was good. And I'm gonna go do something else now. No, it becomes a habit within our life so we don't even think about it. That's what I hope these positive psychology habits become. Gratitude has become that within my life. Exercise is getting there, but it's harder than the gratitude. Writing the two minute positive emails, I have to do because I see such a difference in my life when I don't write those text messages or emails. So just like with brushing our teeth, we don't allow our brains to get tired of it. We know it's an essential. We don't get tired uh, of you know eating at least once a day, right? You know, uh, or, or showering. No one's like, I'm out anymore. Um, but the other side is, I think sometimes we need to um, allow some of those habits to go fallow, like a, a field, right? If I am doing the same habit over and over and over again, just like if you train too much the same uh, you know, muscle group, you don't see the same type of return that oftentimes you need rest in there. I think that that rest cycle, um, feeling okay when we don't hit our habits is exactly what we see when people rest, uh, have, have rest days in their workout cycle. People build more muscles in the rest periods because of that than if they don't. If you see professional athletes, if they don't take breaks, they perform worse and worse over time. And I think the same, the, the same exact thing is true with happiness. You know, I got started back at the divinity school. I think it's fascinating that, you know, in the 10 commandments, which was for, you know, multiple religions, like the center cornerstone of like the rules of how to live life, along with like, you should love God was, you should take a day off a week, right? And what I think is amazing, or like don't murder, also take a day off a week. What I think is embedded in that is that there's a rhythm to life that we have to observe. And if we're not giving ourselves the rest cycles, we don't actually benefit and we can't be there as much for other people. Mm, well said. Um, Sean, it's been a difficult time as we refer to around the crisis for lots of people. I think the most extreme thing that people are dealing with, of course, is fear of their own mortality, but particularly loss, loss of loved ones. And so Christine's asked a really powerful question. Um, Hi, Sean, I've just lost a very dear friend um, and I've not been able to say goodbye to her because of COVID. And I'm really struggling with this. Thanks, Christine. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no solution to that. But what, what sort of observations could, could help Christine in that sort of situation? Well, first of all, I'm so sorry um, that that person is dealing with that. And we, we're seeing this across the globe and the loss isn't just because of the pandemic, it's people losing jobs or we see depression rates skyrocketing. In the United States, one study suggested that happiness rates, uh, the unhappiness rates were the highest in 50 years. So on the one hand, I would say you're not alone, right? That people are, are struggling in the midst of this and that uh, rational optimism means that we don't sugarcoat the reality, right? The loss is loss. Um, even in the research we do on post-traumatic growth, where, you know, we have a trauma that creates, you know, a positive change in someone's life, like they get in a car accident and suddenly they become more optimistic. At no point do we say that the trauma was good, right? The trauma is inherently negative. Cancer is inherently negative. We can create positive things on the backside of it, like deepening our social connection through a social support group, but the trauma itself is negative, right? So the loss of someone dear to us is a trauma. It's something negative. It's something that w requires grief. I think that people that are happy all the time actually don't get to study because that's a disorder because you're di divorced from reality. So having those moments within our life where we experience loss, where we feel 
devastated by the injustices in the world, um, I think is an important realization that's crucial as long as it doesn't break our belief that eventually our behavior might matter if linked to the people around us. That in the midst of going through life that there are ways of still being able to build up growth. If you think about it, we have a word for trauma, uh, a negative event that causes cascading negative uh, consequences. We don't have the opposite word. We don't have a word for a positive event that creates ca cascading positive changes within our life. I've searched for one, at least in English, I haven't found one. And if that's the case, we don't even know how to study it, right? So what we're really looking for are those moments in our life where we could actually you know, impact somebody even when we're hurting or in chronic pain or feeling loss to see that our behavior still matters when we smile at somebody else or that that gives us an opportunity to talk to other people who have just lost somebody as well that somebody who hasn't lost somebody might not have the ability to do so. So I'm sorry to that person that's grieving and I'm sorry for the loss um, and I hope it gets better. Thank you, Sean. And it's lovely to see so many people actually in the comments just sharing their compassion to Christine in that situation. Um, that's, that's a really helpful way of looking at it. Um, and another thing you've mentioned, which I found helpful uh, in my own life around sort of a mindfulness practice, because mindfulness is not trying to, it's a sort of non-judgmental way of saying, this is the reality of the situation we're in, good or bad. And I've, you know, like all of us experienced really dark times as well. Um, you, you mentioned meditation as one of the sort of skills alongside gratitude and so on, but I haven't really explored that. And so quite a few questions around that. And Anjan has just asked, how can mindfulness help with being happy? And I guess I'd, I'd add to that. And what's your own personal practice around that that you find helpful? So I studied Christian, Christian and Buddhist ethics when I was at the divinity school. I grew up Christian and Christian, wanted to compare it to something that I had never been exposed to in Waco, Texas, um, and saw so many connections between those concepts. And meditation actually became a part of my practice, not only as a positive psychologist, but as a religious person as well. One of the things that I struggle with, I remember taking a class called Engage Buddhism because it was a challenge within Buddhism where if we take solely a non-judgmental approach to the world, um, we miss out on the ability to say that uh, racism is wrong, that social injustice is wrong, that, uh, that losing somebody we care about is devastating, right? In the midst of that, we want, I think we want to be able to retain that. To me, mindfulness is awareness of possibilities in the present. Um, I, I got to work in the mindfulness lab of Ellen Langer, who I thought was brilliant. And part of what she looked at, th this is at Harvard and her lab where, you know, she was kind of like a renegade where um, she would ask questions like, what happens if you change the way you thought about yourself instead of thinking of yourself as a, you know, a 75 year old, you thought of yourself as a 55 year old for one week at a retreat center. And they found that their posture improved, eyesight improved by 10%, uh, memory improved, like all these health benefits that shouldn't be happening based upon changing the concept of, of the way that we experience the world. To me, mindfulness is an awareness of the positive in the midst of the challenges we experience within our life. Um, so for example, like I was talking about those gratitudes with that jar, my brain lost access, was not mindful about the 80% of the blessings in my life, but was mindful of the negatives in my, in my life. I think whatever your brain attends to first becomes your reality. So part of what I want to do is be aware, in, uh, be aware that there are multiple ways of processing this world. There are multiple realities in this moment. This pandemic prevents all these things in my life. This pandemic also opens up all these possibilities in my life, right? And in the midst of that, we try to choose the most valuable and adaptive reality so that it allows us to create creating positive change in our life. And I think that's the heart of Action for Happiness, being able to recognize that our individual behaviors, one, we're not doing alone, you're doing with thousands of people across the globe, but also that those individual habits don't just change you, it creates possibilities for all the people that see how your life has been changed as well. I couldn't think of a better uh, sentiment to end on, Sean. We're out of time and I, I would fully endorse what you've just said there. I think you've helped us remember that you know, our, our actions matter, that what we do really does make a difference to our own happiness, but crucially, to others around us as well that life isn't perfect and that's okay and and that we can choose to respond in a constructive way and to to scan for the good as well as to inevitably notice what's wrong as we do naturally i'm so grateful to express my gratitude to you for giving your time to us all this evening 
and also just for the amazing um, comments and community and people sharing a lot of gratitude and, and kindness to each other. It's just been lovely to be part of this global family. Is there anything sort of in terms of final thoughts you'd like to leave us with this evening, Sean? Um, just gratitude. Thank you so much. I love seeing this chat go through because it reminds us we're not alone, right? Even people who study happiness, we need to hear that this matters, right? Because it seems so paltry sometimes a few gratitudes in the midst of the challenges, but to see how much it impacts people's lives and that we're not alone, I think we can find a way of lighting in the dark, lighting up together in the dark. And because of that, we can get more people to believe that that's possible for them as well. So thank you for the work you do. Sean, it's been an absolute privilege being with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Keep up the inspiring work and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.